Hi, glad to be here. Um, the next session that we're going to go over is actually with Purple Air, Adrian Dibwad, um, the founder of Purple Air, and I hope his uh, session is queued up. I'm just going to give a quick background about his about him with his bio. Um, the Purple Air organization itself was born in the fall of 2015 out of Adrian's curiosity surrounding air quality in the Salt Lake Valley community. So today, Purple Air's global network has grown to thousands of sensors measuring real-time air quality made accessible to the public via their interactive map. After discovering his passion for technology at a very young age, Adrian spent many years honing his skills in complex electronic repairs, surface mount assembly, and prototyping. This expertise, combined with two decades of experience in computer programming, network engineering, and software developed, development, enabled him to create Purple Air. So I'm going to hand it off to you, Adrian. I don't know if you have a presentation, and you're going to have to go off of mute. Excellent. Yes, hi, Ethan. Um, thank you for the introduction. I don't have a presentation as such. I thought it would be more beneficial to uh, make us available to answer some questions that, that people might have. Um, I think um, you know, that that introduction describes me quite well, and Purple Air is a citizen science network of uh, low-cost air quality sensors that everyone can take part in. Great. So maybe what we'll do is just um, look at some of the questions that have been posed about Purple Air because some of the other um, presenters already mentioned it. Um, and, and I actually I'll just see here. Um, maybe we'll ask you as kind of a supplier here of Purple Air sensors as opposed to a, a user as the other presenters have been. Um, you know, one of the questions that people asked was, how do you calibrate your purple air sensors at the user end? Maybe you can describe what you do as a uh, provider on the provider end about calibrating purple air sensors. Right. So, um, you know, from the very beginning, when, when we first discovered the plan tower laser counters, uh, we had three of them running on the table at the same time, and they all agreed with each other. That was the first time that that had happened, that they agreed with each other. Uh, that three devices in front of me. So I took that as a good sign and we still use that principle to this day in that when we make a batch of sensors, we put them all in the same test chamber, we expose them to some particulates, we watch their uh, curves, the performance, the output of them, and we make sure that they all agree with each other. Um, so that's the checks that we do. Um, then as far as the network goes, when they've been deployed, uh, we have two laser counters in each device for the purpose of data quality. So you, you can see if they agree with each other, then, then it's more likely that they're good. If they don't, you could have something like the spider or a fan failure or something like that that's making one of the laser counters uh, read weird. So it's very unlikely that something like that would happen in both channels at the same time. So that's why we have two channels in each sensor. Uh, it makes you able to trust the, the output much better then has has been mentioned already uh, by another presenter is comparing sensors to others in the area you can actually use good air days and bad air days to do somewhat of a calibration across the network where if you have good air across the whole valley and you have only one sensor reading strange you know that there could be something wrong with that sensor or maybe someone's having a barbecue so looking at the dots is a very good way of doing that calibration excellent um, related to that, um, um, I'm not quite seeing it in these questions here, but it's kind of uh, some in inferred questions about uh, correction factors and raw data. You know, so um, you mentioned that you have, you look at the sensors under different conditions, I guess temperature and relative humidity are the two, the two main um, uh, effectors to your, to getting accurate readings about the particles themselves. Um, how do you, and there are correction factors that are out there, and how do you take, how do you help people take those into account, um, you know, in either like high temperature, high relative humidity situations, or low temperature, low, low relative humidity situations, how do you correct, correct, corrected or correctable data? Right, so um, some of the studies that have been done on the sensors do show a humidity effect at high humidities. We're talking about 
90%, 80% type humidities, which is not all that common in, in the wild. Um, it's, you know, if you're on the coast, maybe you have that more often, but um, we're trying to work the idea of the correction factors on the website, for instance, is that different groups can create their different interpretation of what they think the data should be corrected um, by. And we'll present that as a drop down in the correction factor um, section so that people can view the map with that filter. Um, we don't um, apply any filter across the map overall yet because we don't have a general formula that applies well to everywhere. Um, you know, humidity will make particles swell or uh, make them appear slightly larger or brighter. And so that has an effect on the laser counter, optical reflection type of way of measuring them. And, um, you know, some studies, like I said, have shown that effect only at very high uh, levels. And so mostly it's not all that much of a, of a problem. Now, the biggest thing is the different types of particulates have different uh, properties. They have different densities. They're more reflective, less reflective. And so um, depending on the exact mixture of pollution that you might have in your area, our readings might be off because the density is not uh, the same or not, not standard. For instance, wildfire smoke has a density of, of about 1.5 grams per centimeter cubed. Gravel dust has a density of about 2.8. And so if you've got something that's more wildfire smoke or more gravel dust, you're gonna get different output from these sensors when compared to federal equivalent methods like gravimetric, which actually physically weighs the particles. So you're really trying to compare something that's not really meant to be compared to each other, the count or estimate of reflection of particles versus the actual physical weight of them. It's the density, which is the biggest unknown. Okay, um, just to, we only have about, I don't know, two or three more minutes, but I'm just gonna ask you to, to respond kind of quickly to these last few questions. One is a follow-up to what you just mentioned. Um, in previous um, ASIC presentations by EPA, people presented correction equations. Do you plan to use those in your website or, or what? Absolutely. If people want to submit us their corrections, we will put them on the website. We'll link to their page to describe what the reasons are and everything. So they uh, please share them with us. We'd be happy to get them. Great. Here's another one that a few people have mentioned. How do you deal with um, continued accuracy um, in the long term? This is a very good question. It's something that we are going to be looking more and more at through hopefully the help of partners like the EPA or other groups that are going to study the data and give us some insights. So, you know, we, we are not necessarily a team of scientists. We've, we're engineers who can create a network who can put the sensors out there and then we rely on the public and the scientists out there to help us to make sense of it and to, to process the data next. Great. Another couple of questions, just again, pretty quick quick answers here. Sure. And just as a note to all of the listeners, um, we plan to take all of your questions and um, post the questions and the answers on the basic website. So we only have limited time here. But Adrian, just a couple more here for you. Um, do you have any idea of what the range of a purple air monitor is? You know, people are looking at how to space these monitors um, without having gaps or how to show kind of representativeness of, of a single sensor or a network of sensors? What, what are your, right. what's a quick so, answer um, to that? Uh, the South Coast Air Quality Management District has told us that you don't really have to place them all that close together because they compare to each other so well, like between different models, different uh, sensors, it's, it's really good. So you don't have to have them close together. People choose to put them close together. And, and so, but there's, is there any, um, if you were to say, um, a kind of rule of thumb or a rule that people have used in practice about proximity? Any ideas there? No, because people say, you know what, uh, you got one around the corner from me, but I want one outside my front door. They believe that maybe they've got something going on there that's not around the corner. So uh, they choose to place them close together. But if you're doing a study where you're placing 20 of them, you don't have to put them close together necessarily, depending on the goal of your study. Great. All right, last question. And this one is about um, devices that are, that, that can last longer because they have a more continuous or long-term um, power supply and maybe data connection. Any ideas about uh, you know, adding that kind of functionality? Um, functionality in terms of, of sorry. Uh, in terms of um, uh, power life, maybe 
or something like that, or solar. And then second, in terms of uh, being able to transmit data, um, again, not, not connected to something by a wire. All, both of these things would be something separate. Oh, yes. Separate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we get, we get asked questions about solar-powered or sort of freestanding devices or Wi-Fi, cellular connections, for instance. Um, we don't have something yet that we can offer to people in terms of solar-powered. We advise that you sort of find yourself a solar panel, 15 watt or so, with a 20 amp hour battery to power the thing. Um, you know, batteries, shipping batteries is very difficult. And um, we, we don't want to try and just sell something that doesn't make sense or that doesn't work properly. Um, so we ask people to come up with their own solutions. Um, and then long term, um, you know, we will see, we'll reevaluate. Great. Well, that's going to wrap up our, our discussion with you for now. Thanks for packing a lot of information into a short period. And, and thank you. We're always open to answer questions. So I see there's some other questions that haven't been answered. Please email us. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try our best to answer them. And the drop down of the conversion factors is in the bottom left of the map. Excellent. Thanks. Feel free to post anything if you'd like there as well. For any of the presenters, you're, you're welcome to provide partial or complete answers now.